everyone. Welcome to Champion Brief's topic lecture over Blue Key semifinals legislation. My name's Brittany Stanchek. I'm a congressional debate coach at Desert Vista High School in Phoenix, Arizona. Just some general comments on this lecture before we get into more details on the topic areas. Legislation hasn't been released yet. So this is background information that you want to know. So when you have to prepare under a strict time restraint, you don't have to stress as much. In situations like this, background knowledge is absolutely imperative because one, it helps build credibility for you as a speaker. Two, it helps build the foundation of your arguments. And three, it helps you respond to other arguments made in the round because you already know the content area. It makes it much easier for you. So just keep in mind whether you've heard this information before or not, it is an aspect of the greater topic. So you'll use it at some point in time. That being said, let's jump right into the first of three topics that the tournament has released, and that's agriculture. Important concepts and definitions you may want to know, and again, keep in mind the topics haven't been released, but what we're about to cover can play into the topic somehow. And if you don't use them now, you will use them in the future. I can guarantee that. The first is agriculture subsidy, which is money allocated to farmers in order to supplement their production. Common legislation in the past has focused on subsidies, either cutting or increasing them. More so than not, these have had specific details, such as increasing subsidies to do a certain action. For the sake of what we're talking about as an example, we'll say to send extra produce to developing nations. Both of these options are possible here. If it's the former, narrowing in on details, such as actions we can take if we cut or fund subsidies is important. If it's the latter, sticking to basics about subsidies is critical to the overall debate. So essentially, you're going to do the exact opposite of what you're given. If you're giving something broad, you're going to go narrow. And if you're given something narrow, you're going to go broad. Second deals with U.S. farm bills. These aren't necessarily annual. They're released every five years or so. The most recent one was actually two years overdue. So it just depends when they come out, depending on how much Congress gets done. U.S. Farm Bills are enacted policies that cover agriculture in the U.S. They entail details on things from food safety to international trade. The most recent Farm Bill is the Agriculture Act of 2014, which was signed in February of this year. It includes the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP, which assists individuals and families with low to no income. These do not have health standards like the Women, Infants, and Children Act, also known as WIC. And that's important to know because it links back to subsidies and creating more food to meet the demand of the program. So if the legislation does deal with any aspect concerning these programs, make sure you discuss what is best for the American people, or at least the individuals enrolled in these programs. It also includes a breakdown of spending. Food stamps and nutrition account for $756 billion. Crop insurance is $89.8 billion. Conservation is $56 billion. Commodity programs, $44 billion. And anything else is $8 billion. The same aspect of before applies. If it has to do with cutting or funding more, link back to what it would mean for the American people. Third, pesticides. These are substances that destroy any external forces that could have an impact on crops being grown, such as weeds, diseases, or insects. There is a possibility of legislation dealing with changing pesticide use or cutting pesticide use. If that's the case, it will probably outline in the legislation what kinds of pesticides. That's something you will need to be prepared on and know different kinds that are outlined in the legislation. Even if the Bill of Resolution deals with subsidies in general, pesticides are a large aspect of the agriculture sector and are definitely something that you should discuss and link back to the legislation. These are common based on the general topic, so you should do some extra reading on your own, at least based on the information that's found in the legislation, because you'll have a few hours to do so. It will be released ahead of time just so that you're prepared. Information in terms of agriculture subsidies or just general agriculture that you want to know based on possible topics. First are highest produced commodities. So top five 
in the respected order is corn, beef or cattle meat, milk, chicken, and soy. That doesn't mean that these are the highest funded. That would be first corn at 84 billion since 1995, second wheat at 35 billion, and third uh, soy, which was 28 billion. There is the possibility that the legislation may be based on producing healthier foods, so funding more towards, say, apples or general fruits and vegetables as opposed to corn, wheat, and soy, or at least cutting down in the amount of unhealthy foods that are produced. If this is the case, you can actually work in mentioning SNAP or WIC as we defined up above. Second, there are different kinds of farms. There are grains, tobacco, cotton, field crops like peanuts, high value crops like fruits and veggies, cattle, hogs, dairy, poultry, and eggs. This is important to know based on the specifics of the legislation. So what kind of farm will the funding go to? Does it make the impacts of the opposing side possible or not? General things in mind that you want to keep um, for the topic area. Third, the agriculture industry is one of the most hazardous industries to work for because it entails exposure to various chemicals and machinery. So action on this kind of legislation is rare, but possible if it falls as a subsection to a larger issue. Four foreign nations can be on the receiving end of crop production in the U.S. That's in thanks to the World Trade Organization and the United Nations. If this does appear, it will most likely appear in the form of drones. So if there is legislation dealing with foreign nations and agriculture, it will probably come in the case of drones. Something else to know is that this can actually harm developing nations. So we give more money to the big farmers here in the United States and simply send aid over instead of investing in these developing nations that need a stable economy. We give more money to our big farmers instead of helping them grow their economy, and that's not good. Five, keep in mind that drones are a serious possibility in crop production, not necessarily just based on foreign nations, but as a topic in themselves, both because they can fly low to drop pesticides and because they can take pictures of the land. If there is a piece of legislation on this, an interesting point would be analyzing the use of drones in other scenarios, such as military use. Don't be afraid to run unique points, just make sure you do the proper linking back to the bill or resolution. Six and finally, agriculture, specifically subsidies, has been linked directly to American health, whether it leads to obesity or not. That goes back to discussing funding corn, wheat, and soy, as opposed to high-value crops such as fruits and vegetables. Again, make sure that you're reading, because these are general but relevant pieces of information that you want to know, but not necessarily specific towards the legislation that will be released later this week before the tournament. The second topic area is Veterans Affairs. The Department of VA really gained attention earlier this year when news spread that 40 American veterans died in Phoenix waiting for funding and appointments that were supposed to be guaranteed and much more functional. The purpose of the department is to provide patient care and federal benefits to veterans and their dependents. That obviously hasn't been successful, so it's very likely that the legislation will revolve around the logistical oversight and funding of veteran affairs. General information that you want to know that can come in handy First, the current Secretary of Veterans Affairs is Robert McDonald. He took over after Eric Shinseki resigned over the death in Phoenix. That's just something to know in terms of cross-examination. Second, there are three divisions of the VA. The first is the Veterans Health Administration, which is responsible for providing health care. Two is Veterans Benefits Administration, which is responsible for loans, insurance, pension, and other benefits. And finally, National Cemetery Administration, which is responsible for proper, proper burial of VA cemeteries. Third, veterans are supposed to receive benefits that include disability compensation, education, life insurance, home loans, pension, rehab, health care, and burial benefits. They've been put under severe scrutiny lately as there's been controversy over whether they've actually been given to veterans or not. So this is most likely a topic of discussion because it has been under the most pressure. And frankly, the whole system of disbursement needs reform. 
If that's the case, you should utilize the narratives of veterans who have been directly impacted by the failures of veteran affairs. It's unique enough to stand out, but standard enough that you can probably link it to almost any legislation that comes up. For the current, so 2014 budget for Veterans Affairs is $152.7 billion. That's up 58% in funding from 2009. So obviously there's been an increase in funding, but the question is whether it's been successful in giving benefits to veterans or not. 56.4% of the budget does go towards mandatory benefits. That's something you want to note. Five, the submitted 2015 budget for VA is $163.9 billion, a 6.5 increase from this year. So obviously there is interest in taking greater action, but what are you going to do with it and will it be effective? Now we're going to talk about general arguments to keep in mind that all fall under the topic of VA reform. It's important to note that regardless of the exact specifics of the legislation, Analysis should be tailored towards what is best for those directly impacted by the legislation, specifically veterans and their dependents. Homelessness is a large issue among veterans, obviously, but it is something to continue to bring up. While there isn't an exact number on veterans, there is the statistic that 12% of the homeless adult population are veterans. So luckily the VA is currently working with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, the overall goal is to end veterans' homelessness by 2015. That's something to keep in mind because if the legislation is focused on funding a certain amount of money or creating a whole new system, you would want to link back to what already exists and whether we need to take greater action or not. Post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as PTSD, is experienced by both active members and veterans. It is something to take into account as it can be responsible for unemployment, which we're about to get into, or homelessness. Currently, it's estimated that there are at least 20% of the 2.6 million American veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan have PTSD. It's hard to tackle. Funding isn't consistent enough to handle the issue. It is a possibility that legislation concerning just PTSD will be brought up. If not, again, this is a specific, unique topic that you can link back to the general legislation. So in terms of careers, after members return home, regardless of how long they've been back, they have trouble finding jobs. This has been in large part due to skill translation or even PTSD. The unemployment rate varies by state. For instance, in 2013, Michigan's rate was 10% unemployment for veterans, whereas Delaware's rate was under 4%. This is just important to keep in mind because if nationally, so federally, Congress is asked to do something, would it be better if it were handled on a state level? The legislation may not focus on any of these specific areas, but these are definitely arguments you should discuss. They're the basis of the faults that the VA is experiencing and hopefully can change. The final topic area is immigration reform. Now, this is difficult to narrow in on because immigration reform is so broad. But keep in mind the basics of what we already know. First, President Obama's immigration reform is based on four concepts. First, continuing to strengthen border security. This includes funding towards the border and more training. So if legislation is introduced that is narrowed in on this, it will probably be focused on immigration and customs enforcement. It would be good to know exactly what they control and how effective they've been in past funding and efforts, how it's been dispersed. Second is streamlining immigration. Legislation isn't always based on one extreme or the other. So keep in mind that plans dealing with compromise, so to speak, or minor solutions can be introduced as well. Third is earned citizenship. This doesn't entail granted amnesty right off the bat. Individuals would have to earn it through a variety of ways, ranging from military service to education to passing various tests. If legislation is presented on this topic, it will most likely have different ways to achieve citizenship, not just one. So pay attention to the different aspects of the legislation, most likely a bill. Fourth, cracking down on employers hiring undocumented workers. Bills or resolutions may be narrowed in on employment. So if this were the case, the topic area would be broad over narrow because of the limited options that would be effective. 
And just keep in mind that even though these areas have subsections that we just went over, the legislation will most likely be comprehensive. It will outline various different forms of the general plan. You want to be able to hit all of them, just make sure you don't go over time. Second, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 made it illegal to hire illegal immigrants. That's been strengthened and upheld with things like E-Verify, which forces employers to have background checks for their workers. The problem with this is that it never included anything comprehensive about work visas. That's why many immigrants become illegal simply because they overstay their date. That has been brought up as legislation in the past, but has been filed under visas, not necessarily immigration reform, just something to keep in mind. It's still a possibility. If it's not, discussing visas can be a unique form of analysis that you should discuss. Third, it was we know that immigration reform doesn't necessarily entail deportation or on the other end of the spectrum, granting amnesty and automatic citizenship. It can also entail changes to internal programs such as ICE, which is the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Their job is to remove aliens who pose a danger to the United States. Now, since President Obama has taken office, more than 2 million individuals have been deported that pose no legitimate threat to U.S. national security. When I say individuals, I mean undocumented immigrants. Four is we know that more money is being allocated to the border. In 2014, the funding towards ICE was $5.9 billion. That's 73% up from its original budget when it first started. So again, if legislation is proposed around this, it's probably going to deal with the effectiveness of the budget and the program in general. Five immigrants doesn't just entail adults. It includes children, which goes back to the anchors babies debate, which hasn't been seen in a while, but again, could pop up. While Anchor of Babies isn't likely to make an appearance, it is important to keep in mind those impacted under the demographic of the bill, especially if it outlines dealing with parents staying or granting citizenship and achieving citizenship a certain way. The sixth thing we know is that if Congress doesn't do something, the president will. President Obama has the ability to implement executive action if Congress fails to pass immigration policies. And this has even recently been backed up by Janet Napolitano, who is from Arizona, a state along the border, and understands firsthand what it's like to deal with immigration, let alone immigration reform. So regardless of specifics, remember that your analysis should be recent. So especially based on the topics that are going to be presented, they might be based on current instances. If not, understanding the background information that we just discussed is important. Make sure your analysis is simple. Even if it's complex, it needs to make sense and judges should be able to follow it. Next, make sure your analysis is humanized. This should appeal to judges. So you need to provide emotion and rhetoric into what you're explaining. And finally, on a separate note, make sure that you link back to the exact specifics of the legislation. No matter how prepared you are on a topic or how well you know or you think you know it, if you aren't clear in making connections for the judge, your arguments won't make sense. Do the work for the judge, bring in background knowledge, and you will do just fine.